<laughs> well, it has been a good few days. It's sad when it passes by so quickly. And uh, the Lord has opened many doors for us, but none any more blessed than what we feel when we come to Jordan Baptist. Uh, we certainly enjoy uh, Brother Billy and Chris, enjoy them, the fellowship that we have during the day. The services at night uh, to be able to come together and worship. And uh, the thing I like about your services is that you don't come with a um, set program in mind as to what has to happen. But we just come let the Lord breathe and we're satisfied with what he does. And uh, I love that. And tonight, uh, I'm going to tell you after those two prayers that were prayed, uh, I felt like that was, that, that was all I would need uh, as we come around the altar, that first prayer and that last prayer. Uh, took my heart to heaven and ministered to me. And I certainly appreciate that. Well, your pastor didn't prophesy tonight. <laughs> he did last night. But let's take our Bibles and turn to a familiar passage of Scripture, Luke chapter number 15. We have been... Uh, looking at phrases and words that uh, are found in this parable, of course, that make application to all of our hearts and lives. We notice how he spent all, and the only way to keep from spending all is never to forget the all that has been spent on you. Yes. And we preached on the word and, all those connections and Boy, isn't it refreshing to realize how God plugged us in all the way, even to right here. Plugged us into Jesus, plugged us into the family, plugged us into heaven, those divine connections. And then we looked at the word enough. The prodigal son realized after he had been on that spinning wheel that the father's house had been enough all along. And this is for sinners and saints alike. We can get to the place. And I believe that's where the church has been. And maybe that's why we're going through what we're going through is the Lord's kind of spinning us around to get us to the place to where we again can realize that he is enough. And thank God that he is enough. And then we looked at that word kissed. That's the heart of the text. The love of the Father. Yes, amen. How that he... Love the Son. Aren't you glad our Heavenly Father loves us? And that all that He does for us is based upon His heart of love through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It was kisses, kisses, kisses. Now you do know the difference between a holy kiss and an unholy kiss, don't you? Anybody know the difference? About three minutes is what they tell me. So be careful. <laughs> now my wife's going to kill me over that one. Some of them old timers back there is looking like, I don't get it. <laughs> What's he talking about? Well, you, you know, well, anyway. We better hurry on the word of the Lord. <laughs> Getting a little bit off track here. But I want us to look at verse number 28 and I want to pull out those first four words there that uh, seem so out of place for what is happening here. But yet it is there. The Bible said, speaking of the elder brother, notice this. To me, it's the saddest part of the text. And he was angry. The word anger or 
angry that is found there. Now we'll read down through this text, but I want to say to you that my title, if I had one for it, is I'm glad that I'm not mad. I'm glad tonight, as I stand before you, that I'm not mad. Amen. I'm not mad about being at Jordan Baptist Church. Amen. I'm not mad about the fellowship and the fact that your pastor and wife has fed us every day. I'm just not mad. I'm not mad about the accommodations of the park over there where we've kept the fifth wheel. I'm not mad about the services. Amen. I'm not mad about the singing. No. I'm not mad about the praying. No. I'm not mad about everybody that's come this week. Amen. Matter of fact, I'm closing this meeting out and I'm just so glad I'm not mad. Amen. I'm so glad I'm not mad. Amen. But this old boy is mad. He's mad. He's mad at the brother. He's mad at the father. He's mad about the events. He's mad about his service. He's mad about the sacrifice. He's mad about even his brother's sin. He's even mad because he can't grasp all that he has where he's at. Well, I'm going to tell you, if you're here tonight and you're glad, you're not mad, you're in a good condition. But if you're mad, I'm just going to go ahead and haul off and tell you. If you're mad, it's because you're not seeing things like you ought to be seeing them. I don't care what you're mad about. Let's look at these verses down through here and I want to emphasize some things about I'm glad that I'm not mad. Verse 11, the Bible said, A certain man had two sons. The younger then said to his father, Father, give me the portions of goods that falleth to me. If anybody should have been mad, it ought to have been the father. And he divided unto them his living, and not many days after the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. He began to be in want. He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he went and sent him into the fields to feed swine. He would fain have filled his belly with the husk which the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and despair, and I perish with hunger. I will arise, go to the father, and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he rose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, ran, fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began, well, I like that. You don't ever have to stop rejoicing in the Lord to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and he came and drew nigh to the house, and he heard music and dancing. He called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. Well, I'm going to tell you, if praising God is a strange sound, you're in trouble. If you can't understand what's going on when his name's being lifted up, you're in a bad situation. He said unto him, Thy brother is come, thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. There's too much good happening for us to sit around feeling bad. Can I get a witness? 
I'm preaching to the church. I'm preaching to my heart and to your heart. It's too much light for us to sit around the dark. Too much to be glad about for us to spend our time on earth and waste every minute. I'm going to tell you, every minute that you've, you've been mad, you've wasted 60 seconds of which you could have been glad. He received him safe and sound. It looks like, boy, right here, did you just get ready? The brother says, praise God, you mean he's home? He's home? Where is he at? I want to find him. Why had not you told me before now? And he was angry. That sounds childish, but it has a wicked bend to it. Anger does. And would not go in. Selfish. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. Boy, he's got high marks for himself, hasn't he? He's perfect. And yet thou neighbor gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. <laughs> Now, I don't know why this never happened on the behalf of this son, but I'm just going to conjecture and guess. That his father reckoned that it wouldn't do no good because he didn't have no friends. You've got an attitude like that. It's hard to have friends. Right. <laughs> People don't like to hang around folks that are always mad and angry and upset. Right. So I would have, but you ain't got... We wouldn't know where to send the invitations. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Are you seeing that there? But as soon as thy son was come, which hath divided thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. Well, my question is, how do you know so much about what this boy's done? How, where'd you get that news from? How come you're the expert on the wrong? Thou hast killed for him the fatty calf. You've done the preeminent thing for him. And he said unto him, listen to the father, Son, God had always been as good to this boy as he had the other boy. But he's even more blind than his brother was. Religion won't make you right. Going to church won't make you right. Singing in the choir won't make you right. He was me. Notice it. He said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. And it was me that we should make merry and be glad. We, we, we. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and... He's found. Amen. Now let me just take a few moments here. And I know this is a strange sermon, but I, I, I use, when I'm going to preach on a text, I like to camp out in it, and what I see is what I see. That's all I can right. see. And what I saw, that one of the preeminent things in this parable is the anger of this boy. It pivots on that. But I said I'm preaching on, and I am, I am. I, I'm going to have an up, upward note to this, a rejoicing note in it by simply saying, and all our hearts can say this, I don't care where you're at. If you see things as you ought to see them, you'll end up being glad that you're not mad. Amen. I don't know if anybody ever watched. You ever let your kids see those veggie tales? Huh? Anybody ever see angry eyebrows? You ever see them angry eyebrows? You've got to get that for your kids. I mean, 
When, when, uh, and in it, when somebody gets mad and angry and stays angry, the eyebrows fly in. They, it's like they have a life of their own and they attach right here. They got them angry eyebrows. Grandma gets mad. I mean, it starts with that. And, it, and then everybody, your madness makes everybody else mad because you just want everybody to feel what you feel. Let's all be mad about what I'm mad about. But it is not until you get glad that the angry spirit of those eyebrows fly away. The attitude changes. I was thinking about um, Patch the Pirate. Anybody ever let your kids listen to Patch the Pirate? Those, oh, those are good. You got to get those. Got to get those. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> The little old boy that's on the board of the ship, he gets cantankerous. And he's visited by what is called King Me First. And he comes on that boat and he gets that little old boy, I forgot what his name was, do you remember? <laughs> we listened to it more than the kids did. Anyway, he's kept, he said, this is not right and that's not right and get the point out and they're not doing it. You need to have your way sometimes and you need to be in charge sometimes. And, and so he said, come with me and I'll take you to a place to where you can be, you can be first and, and it can be all about you. But he didn't realize him was he was taking him, he took him off the boat to the island of no sing sing. And boy, when he got there, all the songs had left. There wasn't any melody in his heart, and he was out there all along. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If, if being mad or angry will do anything to you, it'll push everything else out of your heart. And he's mad. He's mad at the brother. He's mad about the party. He's mad about those that are involved in the party. He's mad about his job, how long he's worked. He's mad. He's mad. Matter of fact, he's mad. if you're mad, there's nothing else in there but anger. There's no room for anything else. Mad. <laughs> you ever been mad? few times. But when I talk about this anger here, I'm talking about a vicious, dark anger. His anger, that word anger means to be possessed, almost with a demonic feeling of hate and viciousness. So much so that you can tell that the last thing on earth that he wanted to happen was for his brother to come home and get right. right. In other words, let's apply it this way. It's kind of like finding somebody that's never going to be happy in heaven until somebody goes to hell. And I tell you, we find that in our churches. We come in and sing our little songs, and somebody back here can't stand. That's why they're sitting way or whatever it is, is because they can't stand them, but yet they want to act up there. They're, you know, at the house. But it's full of hate and viciousness, anger. Can I say to you that you're never more like the devil than when you are angry? And it, it is an anger that cannot be quenched, an anger that will not stop. Angry, angry. You do know that that's what the devil is. He's an angry being. He's like a lion that goeth, goeth forth, seeking who he can, a roaring lion. He's mad. You never looked at a lion and said he's happy. Especially when he's pouncing on his prey. He's mad. Matter of fact, in the book of the Revelation, the Bible talks about when he was cast out of heaven, that it talks about how he's chasing, talking about the children of Israel. Of course, it has application to the people of God. He's chasing the, her into the wilderness, and it uses the word fierce, with fierce anger, fury, uncontrollable madness. That's the devil. That's the devil. 
And you can look through the scriptures and see examples of it. Jezebel was an angry woman Amen. killing the prophets of God. Ahab was an angry, Pharaoh was an angry emperor and king. He was angry. If you want to see anger, go to uh, the book of Daniel and see Nebuchadnezzar when the children of Israel will not bow. His, the, vis the, the, the visage of his face, the Bible said, changed and he caused them to heat the fire up seven times more than it was ever wont to be. He said, I'm mad. Man, and where there is anger, the end is never well. Right. And it is never good. Right. But we must ask ourselves this question, what in the world are we angry about? Right. Let us consider, let us look around and see why that we are angry. Now, simply three thoughts about the anger of this boy that we can apply to our own lives. I'm glad I'm not mad because anger makes you miserable as much as anybody else. But here's how to be successfully angry. Here's how to live in anger. We're going to look at this boy and find out how we can live with a hot temper to make ourselves miserable and everybody around. Now, I'm, I'm bringing this down now. I know it don't sound like it right now to a rejoicing note. <laughs> but in the meantime, we've got to see this. The first thing that I want to look at is in verse number 29. Now, we know verse 28, he's angry, he's upset. He's wanting to spoil the party. And he answering said unto his father, These many years do I serve thee. He's been counting. He's been counting. He's been calculating. Neither trespass thy, uh, thy commandment in any time. Yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as thy son was come, which devoured thy living, he's calculating again, with harlots thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. The anger of this boy, and anger is always to be found connected to the figures, to the mental calculations or could I say to the comparisons, to the comparisons. He is looking and counting. I mean, I worked all this year. I worked all last year. I worked all. The reason why he could say that is because he's, he's not enjoyed his work. He's, he's not been thankful that he's a part of the family and being able to enjoy all the benefits of being in that family. He's counting the years that he's been working. And while he's counting the years he's been working, he's counting the years that his, father, his brother has not been working. So when he brings it all together and he adds up all of the figures, he vomits all over his father because he is simply saying to him, the way I figure it is, he has not done what I have done and I can see no reason why you would give him so much and even more than what you've given me. I've been watching this, Dad. I'm looking at it. I've figured this thing instantly. You've even done the supreme thing. You've killed the fatted cat. You've had a party for him. You've not done it for me. He's figuring and he's calculating and he's comparing. Right. Now it's very simple. If you're sitting around all the time looking over your shoulder to see what somebody else has got and what you ain't got and measuring how you both have been treated equally or given to equally. I promise you, I promise you, you're going to end up mad. Yeah, 
It's like the parable that Jesus gave of the one that came and went to work at the first hour and then those that came on later and then finally at the 11th hour and then when Jesus went to pay them off, he paid the last first and gave him as much as he did the first and he paid him last. And that last, the one that came first that was paid last had been watching as, as the master, the good master of the house was paying the others off and he noticed he was paying them as much as he paid him but they didn't work as long and he got mad. Well, I'll tell you, if you're on the job always comparing your check stub, let me see how much you got. How many hours you put in? How much did they take out of your, what was your, what'd you, what'd you, what'd you make? <laughs> I'll tell you what I did. I, here's what I did yesterday, and here's what you did today. And I watched that you didn't do as much as I did. Most problems in marriages are, are those things where we're all keeping account on each other. Huh? Well, I'm going to tell you what. If you would have done what I did and, uh, and, and, and seen what I did compared to what you do, uh, you'd be mad too. <laughs> Getting your little pad out and, and going to figure on comparisons. Calculations. I'm here to tell you it ain't ever going to come up to where you think. If you are a figuring type person, it's never going to figure out. You're always going to be mad. Amen. You're right. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, they let her sing Monday night <laughs> and Wednesday night. I only sing yeah. Tuesday night. And they think I'm not watching, but I am. And I'm writing it down. That's why you're mad. Huh? <laughs> called on him to pray and didn't call on. I am, they hadn't even called on me to pray in three days. And thinks I don't know that. You let someone get aggravated in church and, you'll, and all, it'll always come up to figures. They'll say, what do you think? And, and it'll always have a comparison in it, a calculation in it. That's right. I mean, you know, I was preaching in a meeting and there's a family that sings, to a mother and a daughter, and they are so precious. The Hendersons. I don't know if you've heard the Hendersons. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I always say that because they only come just them and they don't have anything with them, no, no guitar, no nothing. And, and I always tease them. I say, well, you know, the only thing I dread about just singing is all that equipment. <laughs> I call them my praise team. I said, churches nowadays have to have a praise team. Boy, I'm going to tell you, they are a praise team. Just old backwoods girls and just let her open up and let her fly. Well, we were in this service together, in this meeting, and at the end of the meeting, uh, I, we're going back home, and the phone rings, and she's, and she's calling me. She said, Brother Dana, have you looked at your check? I said, no, I haven't. She said, well, you might ought to look at it. I said, well, why? It's sort of odd. She said, well, I think I've got yours, and you've got mine. <laughs> And I've teased her about this over the years, even when she's in a service. I said, well, tell me how much yours is, and I'll tell you how, tell me how much mine is, and I'll tell you how much yours is. She said, well, you tell me first. I told her how much hers was. And then she got silent. You know why? Because she hated to tell me how much mine was, because she got more than I did. <laughs> I said, I'm mad. They thought more of the singing than they did the prayer. You do that here. I mean... I mean, I, I, if I can't come back again, y'all be all right as long as I send the answer. I can tell that. But I'm glad I ain't mad. All of that calculating and measuring and finding out, you know, well, children, children can become bitter, calculating their whole lives and even turn themselves into a black sheep. Well, yes. well I'll just tell you, I'm the black sheep of the... Who said you were? Right. Who's been figuring on this? You didn't get... Two bars of ice cream one day and your brother did and now you're the black sheep your whole life? Huh? Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? His problem was he had his little pad and every day he put down everything he did with a note. Brothers know where to be found. So when the party happened, 
He got that out and he used that on his father. Here, I got the facts right here. I, Dad, I got it right here. I've got it marked down now every single day. And on top of that, I'll just tell you right now, I ain't like him. I've not even broke one of your commandments. Which means he's, he's operating in the realm of commandments. He's figured out that he's perfect and his brother's imperfect and so he knows at the end that he deserves more but now he thinks he's getting less and he's mad. Well, turn your TV on and look at all those people marching out there and you can look in their eyes and tell they are mad because they've been figuring that they've been on the short end of the stick. Hmm? They are mad. Oh, I want to say to you, if you want to be successful in a miserable life being mad, just go around with the figures. You'll always find someone or some reason in your figures that somehow you ought to be treated better than what they are, and you're mad. You do the math. Do the math. I'm going to tell you, you do the math in your marriage, and you won't be together long, you'll both be mad. Because, I mean, it just ain't going to add up. You do the math on the preacher in the church, you won't be around here long. It won't want to add up. You do the math on your friendships and you won't be friends long. You won't have no party because it'll be an embarrassment. They won't come to the party. Right. <laughs> right. Father didn't say it, but he might as well have. So I, I've known you your whole life. I don't know that you got any friends. The figures. His anger is bottled up in the figures. Secondly, I would say to you that his anger is, is bottled up in his feelings. In his feelings. Well, you can see it, how he feels. I mean, it is very evident here. Look, verse 28 again, he's angry. And what's the next phrase said? And he would not go in. No, I don't want none. I'm not going. Children do that in the home. Yep. Hmm? He is expressing how he, he's operating off his feelings. He feels mad and he feels Upset. So as a result of that, here's the, here's the key to anger in this matter of feelings is what you will do is you will begin to express your feelings because what anger will do, it will, it will give you a sense of control of the situation. If I get mad enough, now you may not be thinking this, but this matter of anger within itself is a control factor. It'll control you, that's why you're miserable. Everybody's angry is, is controlled, self-controlled with madness. But it'll not only control you, you will be able to use it. It is, it is sort of a penalty or a judgment within itself on others. If I don't go in, then they won't, it'll spoil, they won't have a party. I ain't showing up. Hmm? Didn't shake my hand the last time I was out. I'm not going back. <laughs> you see, he's interested. Notice the control that he's trying to enforce on the father. He's telling the father, you know what? Why? You, that fatty calf should not have been given to him. We should not have spared the expenses of this feast and this party on him. 
Because of the way he sees things and the way he feels things, he wants to control the father, he wants to control the brother, he wants to control the situation out of the control that is within him. He's mad and he wants to use that on others. Anger is an ungodly effect. Now, I know that the Bible said we are to anger and sin not. There are some things that should make us mad in holiness. Jesus went in and turned the tables upside down in the temple. But that's, that, that happens, that, that's all right, that's a purified anger. But anger toward a brother, anger toward a sister, anger to, because of a, a, a selfish cause is, is, a, is a wicked thing. And all it is used for is as a device to try to control the atmosphere, to try to control what happens and what does not happen. It has that, that desire to reach out and to change everything. Could you imagine that? That your spirit wants no singing. Your spirit wants no rejoicing. Your spirit wants no forgiveness. Your spirit wants no, no return of the brother. Your spirit wants no forgiveness. Your spirit wants you. Those, those things we don't realize that we are attacking those divine things that God's wanting to do just with a spirit of anger that shuts it all down. Because anger will put a chokehold choke hold on all the other good spirits. You can't have both at the same time. He's wanting to control everything in the text according to how he sees things and according to how he feels things. Oh, a tool of punishment. Control, control. Wait a minute, I came in at the first hour, he came in at the 11th hour, and I just don't think you ought to take and pay him the same as you paid him. And the, and the, and the, uh, the, the good man of the house said to him, this is mine, can I not do with mine what I want to do? Can I not give what I want to give? Everything in here belongs to the Father. If he wants to have this time of rejoicing and this feast, it was his sacrifice. If he wants to do so, it ain't nobody's business, even the son's business. Well, how we ought to look around into the lives of others and desire that they be blessed. Desire that they be brought closer. Desire that God's grace would be poured out. Not measuring and not going according to what we feel we know and what we think we see. You see, this boy can't see what the father sees and has seen. He doesn't know the fullness of it. This boy can't even see how the father sees him. Boy, we ought to be thinking about that. The father sees us in our spirit and in our attitude. He, he sees what has gone on in the far. He sees the need of the brother. And this old boy can't even see himself in the right perspective because of simply he's settling it on one thing. This is how I feel about it. And I think everybody ought to jump in with me and feel like I feel. Yeah. Right. Well, I bring you back to that thought. If your spirit depends upon your feelings, you're going to be mad a whole lot because most folks don't get offended. Most folks don't care how you feel. i got news for this boy. Those that are in there having the party could care less. They don't even know he's mad. <laughs> now, that'll really make you mad. If you get mad and they don't know you're mad, now, I'll tell you what you do about that. If you get mad, you, know, you just stomp your foot. Or pick up something and throw it. Just don't say no bad words. <laughs> A 
Because Christians aren't supposed to cuss unless, you know, you got them screen door cussing when you slam it. You're going, whoo, whoo. And don't look like saints. You know you've done it. And you children sitting back there, you know what I'm talking about. There have been many a times when the father and the mother set up some rules, and I'm not fussing at you about that because I've done the same thing. And, and, and you just all got all boiled up, and you're just going to be a little late for lunch or whatever, you're going to come in. And when they have to say to you, what's wrong with you? Then you know that you've been angry, and you're trying to control the whole house with your party, with your pity party. Not the right kind of party, the pity party. <laughs> There's a great party going on the inside. There's two parties here in this text. I just thought of that. There's two parties in this text. There's a praise party inside and a pity party outside. What kind of party are you having? Right. Had a pastor call me just, he said, pray for him, my son. He's, he's, he's going wild and everything. And he said, I sat down and we had a family talk. And he said, well, uh, why, why, what are you upset about? He said, well, you just won't let me have things my way. <laughs> Dad just turned the whole family over to me. I mean, just, I mean, you know, I'm, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, 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 I'm. one preacher, uh, and his, his son is a preacher now, but they sat and told me this story, and, and, and I, they laughed about it. The old boy come in one night at 3 o'clock in the morning, and uh, he, was, he was 19 years old. He said, he said, where you been, boy? He said, I was out to neighbors. I said, you're lying. He said, I just got off the phone with them down there. And he went out. He said, Dad, I'm 19. You need to, he said, you're saying I need to treat you like a man? He said, yeah. He said, I got up. I knocked him in the floor, throwed him into the refrigerator, kicked him in the ribs, sent him up to the bed and said, okay, I've treated you like a man. We'll talk about it in the morning. <laughs> I asked the boy, I said, what'd you do? He said, I was home by 11 every night after that. <laughs> it didn't seem like he controlled the situation. He said, well, did it work? Well, I know, I know those kind of things don't work most of the time, but the old boy, is, I, he's a pastor of a church right now, got a good spirit. I guess he cured some things. <laughs> now, I'm not giving you no advice on none of that. But what I'm telling you is, that this man, if, 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 I mean, if you're going around figuring all the time, you're going to figure some reason to be mad. And if you're going around operating on your feelings and how you see things, you're going to see some things that are going to make you mad. Instead of a praise party, you'll have a pity party. Now, this is one of them off-the-cuff sermons, so I know it ain't one of them I ain't even got it ironed out yet but it's it's the truth so he's operating uh, the reason why he's angry he's operating off of figures and off of feelings but here, here is the the key to it all and it is the truth that he wants everything to be fair Now, I want to ask you this question. Don't answer it right now. Is your God, don't even shake your head, is your God fair? If your God, is your God fair? This is the problem that he has with his father, is he's found out his father ain't fair. You know why that the man at the 11th hour, at the first hour, is so mad at the end because the 11th hour got as much as him is because he found out that the owner was not fair. Well, how come you gave him as much? That, that's not fair. How come you're killing for him the fatted calf and we're having this big party and look how long I have worked and how many years I've worked and how perfect I have been and I'm getting none of that. What he's screaming out is, is I, that's just not fair. Well, there's only two ways that you can operate in a spiritual realm with a divine God. And they're going to depend, they're going to determine your spirit. Number one, you can go through life 
weighing out how much you've done for God, and then on the next line, check and see if he's fair. Peter tried that with the Lord. Yes. He said, Father, we've given up houses and lands. Or Jesus, we've given up houses and lands and everything else. He said, what are we going to get out of that? Are you going to be fair with us? The only problem is, if God's fair with you, he's going to give you what you deserve. And no more. If you want to get out your spiritual pen, as this old boy did, and you want to say, hey, I want everybody to be fair. <laughs> Do you know how much you're worth? Nope. You see, I'm going to follow this and listen to what I'm saying. I found out my God is not fair. Because if he had been fair, his son wouldn't have went to the cross. Amen. You're right. Was it fair that Jesus was born into this world into poverty, had no place to lay his head? Was it fair that he was hungry and thirsty? Oh. Was it fair that they took him and tried him and, and whipped him with the cat of nine tails? Was it, what did he do to deserve to have the beard plucked from his face and to be slapped and to be nailed to an old rugged cross? That's not fair! If God had been fair with all of us, we'd be in hell. But understand, God does not operate on the principle of figures and feelings and fairness. He more operates off of grace, thank God. It's not a matter of commandments. This boy's operating in a world of rules and regulations and didn't realize that the heart of the Father was a heart of grace and a heart of mercy. A heart of favor. Love. A heart of love. And he tries to tell him that. Look what he said. He said, son, son, that ought to be enough to thrill you. To be a part of the family of God ought to throw all the figures out the window and everything else because you don't deserve that. Son, thou art ever with me. And notice this. All that I have is thine. Woo! Now, calculate. if you want to calculate, go to figuring on that. Spend your time going through the word of God and count the blessings that God has given you. Had a dear lady in the first church that I pastored up a little holler called Roaring Creek. Sister Laura King, she came in one Wednesday night with her cane, 90 some years old, pecked her way all the way down to me. She raised it up. It was un unlike her. And she said, Preacher, I ought to whack you over the head. I said, Sister Laura, that's unbecoming of you. Why? She said, because on Sunday night you told us that before we went to sleep to be sure to count our blessings. And said, I got in my bed and laid my head back on the pillow and started counting my blessings. Said it was 3 o'clock in the morning before I got to sleep. I'm going to whack you over the head. He said, son, all that I have, you've ever been with me and all that I have is thine. The Bible tells us that we're seated in heavenly places. We've been blessed, the Bible said, with all spiritual blessings. We have the fullness that in him doth dwell. It's all, listen to me, everything that God is and has has already been put in your name. Throw the pen and paper away and enjoy the favor and forget about the figures. He's in control of it all. Yes. You find yourself singing amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. <laughs> he said, son, what are you mad about? The title's in your name. The deed's in your name. I'm leaving everything to you. The Bible said we're joint heirs with Jesus. Wow. Wow. If you're always looking at what's fair, you're going to miss the favor. Right. In heart, 
This boy is as broken and wicked as the prodigal son ever thought about being because of anger that he can't see. Here's what he ought to have been glad about, the things he was mad about. He ought to have been glad that he didn't know nothing about a far country. Now, though I was raised in alcohol up till I was, I mean, till I was 14 years old up to here, God delivered me from the taste. I never, I never liked it. I knew rated on two occasions. Most time I got deathly sick and I said, I don't know what this is doing for them. It ain't doing nothing for me. But he saved me at 14. I'm not saying I wouldn't have went that route because I followed my brothers everywhere. But God's, I'm telling you, I ain't mad because I'm not a drunk. But I am happy for every drunk that he delivers and saves. He ought to have been happy. That he'd never had to sit at a hog pen. He never had to learn that lesson. He ought to have been happy that he had known every night what it was like to lie in the father's bed and eat the father's meal and to serve in the father's family. What a privilege it is. I'll tell you why I ain't mad. It's because I could be in hell where others are and I'm going to tell you close to it the way I was raised and here I am in the house of God preaching to the saints and enjoying the spirit of God. I've got no room to be angry. You ought to have been glad. For the sacrifice. He ought to have been glad for the deliverance. He ought to have been glad for the return. He ought to have been glad for the rejoicing. He ought to have been glad. Because he had something to be glad about. Hey, children of God. If you want to do your figuring over here, you can figure. But I'm going to tell you something. If you'll come over here into grace and favor, there's no way to figure all the goodness of God on your account and on my account. So that all we could find ourselves doing is joining in the party of rejoicing for someone else that's been brought in to what we've never had to leave that he has given us. You know, uh, in testimony, a lot of times, uh, and I love to hear all the testimonies of people who God saved out of great iniquity. But I'm aware of the fact that there's some here that God saved you, but you were not in that. And you feel like that you don't have a testimony. But I'm here to tell you something. Amen. The testimony of a person in this day and hour that, that can live a lifetime and never having been indulged in that is greater than the testimony of those that have. And as someone had said, it's, it's far better to have a fence at the top of the mountain than a hospital at the bottom. Amen. And I read a grace get me before I got into that. But I don't care, I don't care what your life has been like. It took as much grace to save you at seven as it did me 14. And I talked to a fellow a while back that God saved at nine years old. Took the same grace. Right. <laughs> no wonder again the songwriter said all of grace. If you want to keep from getting mad, realize all of grace is my story, all the way from earth to glory. I am glad I'm not mad. And I don't want to let somebody that's mad take away 
my gladness. Woo. And he was angry. Let's stand. Lord Jesus, it's been a wonderful few days. We thank you for the privilege of being here. We've received so much in fellowship and friendship and kindness. We thank you for this church. We marvel, Lord, at how much you're doing through it and have done. Thank you for all those missionaries where the sun will never be able to set on the ministry of this church. The outreaches, the burdens that have been shared this week of those that, gentlemen, Lord, that's dying and, and uh, pray, Lord, that you used uh, the one that went to witness to him. And Lord, this, the Riley, the little girl, and how, Lord, you've just set that up. There's so much here to be yes. glad about. Yes. That we've got a word for a wicked world. We don't even need to be mad at this world. Right. It's just doing what the world does. Right. Right. Let us be glad that we are a part of another world. Yes. And rejoice. Mm -hmm. And again, I say, Rejoice and never stop joying for what you've done. Thanking you for the things you've let us be a part of and the things that you have kept us from. We bless thy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen as she plays and sings. All of grace is my story all the way from earth to glory. Since by grace he lifted me from sin and woe. Living grace he has extended as on him my heart depended and he'll give new grace when it's my time to go grace not yet discovered grace not yet uncovered grace from his bountiful For every trial, there's been grace. For every mile, there's been grace sufficient from His vast supply. Grace to make my heart more tender, grace to love and pray for sinner, and there'll be new grace when it's my time to die grace not yet discovered grace not yet uncovered grace from his bountiful shore grace to cross the needed before grace to cross the river grace to face forever there'll be new grace I've not needed before
Can I say to you, children, don't shortchange yourself with God with your figures and your feelings. I mean, if he just brings things up in, in your life to where you feel like it's fair, you're going to be cheated. He's wanting to go way more than that. He's got an unlimited supply. I think about this world. I think about the precious black folks. They're trying to convince them that they need to come up, they need to be at the standard of, uh, of the white privilege. Well, I got news for you. White ain't all it's made up to be. There's something better than that. Amen. I, if, I, if all you're wanting to get is to where white folks are and stop. Oh, yeah, well, boy. I'm going to tell you, his grace will take you so far beyond that Amen. that you won't even think about it. Yes. Trying to convince this old world to leave on, live on a cheap level. He said, son, you worried about the sacrifice? And the, I, it's all yours. Don't go to comparing you with yourself with somebody and think that if you can get there and be treated like they're treated, you're going to be happy. You ain't going to be happy because there'll always be another yes. ladder, right. bar on the ladder. But all oh, if you can wallow around in God's grace and see it everywhere, you can be happy. Amen. Did I tell you the title of this sermon? Yes. What is it? Are you the only one who knows it? <laughs> Somebody help me. What's the title of this sermon? I'm glad I'm not mad. Are you mad? I ain't mad. I sort of figured I ain't got nothing to be mad about. That ought to make me mad. Thank you. I've enjoyed being with you. I tell you, you know, he said that uh, there's a different type of service or sermon, but, you know, the truth of the matter is uh, that's one of the greatest Achilles heel that our American churches has. And, you know, I've went and I preached to people that sit on stumps and rocks for 12 hours at a time. We'd break one time a day and eat rice, and I never heard a complaint. And I was planning on, me and Brother Don was planning on going to Russia at one time, and we was meeting with some folks that had been there, and they told this story. And they said they'd went and got on the plane going to Hungary, and one of the missionaries had asked if, well, they were handing out John and Romans, and they handed Stuart one, Stewardess one. And then they just kept coming back and asking them if they could have another one. They were giving them to all the different employees of the airline, and then the captain wanted some. And they come and said the captain and co and co pilot would like to have one, and they sent them one. And then the missionary said, "Would you mind if?" I just got up on the intercom and shared a little bit about John and Romans. And so they went up and asked Captain, he said, no problem. And so they got to preach to that whole plane, going into a communist country. And they got to share the gospel. And on the way out, everybody was thanking them, except one lady. She come out and she told him this. If I wanted to hear that, I would go to church. She was the only American on the plane. Our churches don't know how to appreciate how good God's been to us. And if we would, we'd be a little bit more glad and quit being so mad. And I'm going to tell you something. Everybody would hate to see you go. But if you think you stub up and you stay at home and you're going to destroy I had one guy tell me, he said, if I don't show up, the church will close its doors. 
I said, if that church is built on you, it needs closed doors. And he quit coming for 15 years. But that didn't prevent the church from going on. The only one that was hurt was him. And uh, sad to be, and you know, I look at that, and that's what I see when I see all those protesters. And they're pretty close by us right now in Louisville. I saw some of the police taking them down and handcuffing them and taking them away just because justice didn't go their way. But this country's going to be sad whenever it starts bending to the appeasement of what they want just because they protest. But they talk about how the Christians are full of hate. You look in their faces, they're full of hate. Watch your actions, they're full of hate. They need the love of God. And I feel sorry for them. I feel sorry for them. But that's a good message, and, and boy, the church does need to hear it. Uh, I, I want to say that I, I do appreciate 